again. Good morning. My name is Sam McClung. Normally, I am working with the youth department, with the middle school and the high school kids. Um, that is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And as a matter of fact, I, it, was, it was really awesome that I had the Pogues up here this morning because when I was in middle school and high school, they were some of my youth pastors and just, just kind of awesome to see them this morning and, and be that and just kind of the full circle. Um, I, I know that uh, if hopefully that doesn't make you feel old because you're not, you guys look the exact same as you did then. Um, now what made me feel old is when the Tucker... Chrislyn came in, the girl who I was classmate with her mom in school, and now I have all of their, their kids in my youth group, and at that point I went, I'm old. Um, so I'm happy to be with a group that I can give a pop cultural reference, and you guys might actually get it, uh, so that, that'll be a really good thing. Um, but I also wanted to share with you something that's been going on, and that is fifth quarter. Okay, We've been doing fifth quarter now. Uh, this past Friday was our third week. And we had over 40 kids there Friday night after the ball game. So, and, and that is an amazing thing. So here's one of my favorite things from this past Friday. We had a group of girls get dropped off. And we, we have a sign-in procedure. And a lot of parents, the first time they're there, are like, what is it? Um, because, you know, we want to make sure the kids are safe, that kind of thing. Uh, not to mention there was a few motorcycles around, so I think they were afraid there was a motorcycle gang. Um, but it, there was a motorcycle gang, but it's the most awesome gang that we could ever have. Uh, they do have a wonderful men's choir. It says, make a joyful noise. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, so it was really awesome thing. So these, these ladies come out, and I kind of wave at the mom, and she's like, hey, hey. Um, she said, well, I'm just waiting to see if they want to stay, which I get, I get, I totally understand, but here's the awesome thing. So I'm getting them signed in and everything, and I'm telling them what we got going on. It took them less than two minutes to give their mom a double thumbs up. So that's a really awesome thing to do that because as, as I said, I said, okay, People, you know, I want them to not go out there after the game and do something stupid. I want them to come in here and do something dumb with me, okay? <laughs> stupid gets you hurt. Dumb gets on Facebook, all right? Um, <laughs> that gets you followers. But no, here's the deal. So, so and, and, and typically, and the, the Pogues would, would agree that, that when you work with youth ministry, you typically don't see the rewards in what you're doing immediately, it takes a little time. It takes a little time. So I had one situation where I kind of saw it immediately, and I want to share that with you. This was a couple nights ago. Um, I had this one young man come up to me. It's towards the end of the night. And he, he, can, he came up and he said, now, is this a one-time thing? I said, no, we're going to do it after every home game. He said, every home game? Like, so Thursday after the junior? I'm like, no, 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 no. I got to sleep occasionally. Um, so, no, 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 after every home East game, he's like, okay, okay. And he's excited and he's like, all right, that's cool, that's cool. And then you see kind of, well, but are you going to charge next week? I said, no, 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 no charge, no charge, no charge at all. Um, and, and you can see he's excited and he's, he's ready to go, but he has this moment of this, this curiosity of what's up. And he filed, I said, I said, we just want to have a good time, and this is here for you. He said, no, no, you're going to feed me. You're going to give me a place to go. You're going to have all these games. You're going to have this and this. And my mom knows you, and she's going to let me come back. This is awesome, all right? So, um, but, but here's what it is. He was looking for the catch. He was trying to figure out what the hook was. Because we're throwing out some bait, but there's no hook on it. We are throwing out the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ to a generation who is so used to, who, who is so used to people doing things for them so that they can get something from them. And we don't want anything from them other than that they don't do something stupid out there. 
We want to show God's grace, love, and mercy to them, to a world that needs that more than anything else. And so that's what we're doing. And so I'm going to use that as a launching pad for the next little bit. We have two more nights, two more this season. And there have already been requests for basketball season. There's a lot of games for basketball. <laughs> There's a lot of games. Uh, but no, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's a great, great, great thing. So I want to talk to you. How many of you agree that you've been prayerfully asking God, God, please show me where you can use me. Show me what you have for me, where I can do the things for your kingdom, for you, Lord. Where are some places? What can I do for you? Well, good news is I talked to God this morning, and we have some opportunities. We have the next game is October 11th. The last game of this season is November 1st, and we have some opportunities for you to serve there. So talk to me after the service, and I guarantee you, here's something else. If you're like, no, 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 that's just two more things. So I need something more, because I know you've been praying hard. So, you, so there is no, when we talk to you, go, well, let me go pray about it, because you already did. Okay, so we already know you already prayed about it, and you said, so we're showing up. This Wednesday night, there are openings in every youth department for you. That lady right there with her hand up is ready you come talk to that beautiful, wonderful woman of God, and she will help you serve God this Wednesday. This may not be your ministry for the next 10 years, but we have a place for you starting this week. Okay? How's your toes? Good, because we have a place for you, and God told me. I talked to him this morning. He said it was okay. All right. So, all right. I, I say that now. I want to start with today's lesson, and we want to look at um, a, a, a basic biblical truth that I want us to hold through the entire time, okay? That is, one, that God loves you. That is the basic biblical truth that we want to hold true the whole lesson. Um, one of my favorite things that I do with my kids as often as I can, every night, try to sing, Jesus loves me. And it's awesome. We were out somewhere, and Zeke just randomly started singing it, and it was a restaurant, and everybody went quiet. They just, he's singing it loud. And it was amazing. It was wonderful. He messed up a couple chords, so we'll work on that. No, but it was great. It was just awesome to see the truth in that, because the sum of the gospel can be, can be in that one song. So that's the truth, the foundation, that I want us to start with today. That's my launching point. Um, we have a God who loves us and made us and wants us to be happy and have joy, okay? And there is a difference between happiness and joy, okay? So a lot of times we, we bunch those together because, you know, but, but, but here's a, a quick example here. If I'm hungry and you give me an apple, I'm happy, right? I'm happy. I'm hungry. I like apples. We're good. However... If you hand me five bushels of apples that are ready to be dealt with immediately, I'm not quite as happy because I know my lovely wife and we're going to be making apple butter. And that's work. If you've ever made apple butter, it's work, peeling. A couple years ago, we were making new. I said, well, honey, I'm going to the store. She's like, what? I said, I need a new peeler. Okay. This thing's not working. I'm bleeding. Um, you know, it's not fun. But so I might be a little bit happy, but it's different and because that apple butter is a whole lot of work. Now, joy. Do you know what's a lot more work? That fifth quarter that I was telling you about. That's a lot of work. That is, we took from, from the initial start of contacting the schools, uh, well, before that, even praying, praying with pastor back and forth, is this something, a ministry we want to we wanna go into, uh, go into the schools, go into the community organizations, going to getting together with a group of volunteers, actually showing up, um, 
you know, uh, digging out volleyball net holes that had never been dug out before. Uh, I looked one day, there was an engineer and a doctor working on the hole, and myself and another guy were like, well, we ain't got this. Uh, uh, <laughs> if they can't figure it out, we got nothing. Uh, so, and, and so we got it, we got those going. Um, but, it, you know, but I want you to know, when I look out at that crowd and have these kids coming in, running up and down, running around, that is pure joy. So it didn't have anything to do with the amount of work because there was a lot more work in getting the kids and, and getting all that fifth quarter set up. But it was pure joy, and I look forward to that joy at least two more times this season. So let's make it to the playoffs, and we'll do a lot more. But, but let's, don't count you before they're hatched, all right? Uh, but we want to have so much more fun. Um, again, and today, one thing I want to do is encourage you to help you find the joy, to find the joy that God has for you. Because he has joy specifically for you. No matter where you are, where you, what you've been doing, what station of life you're on, God has joy for you. Psalms 35 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. All right? I know that life happens. It does. A lot of the time, it doesn't work out like you've planned. Um, <clears throat> a a uh, country song a number of years ago that I think is one of the only songs from this group that I ever really heard, Van Zant, um, has a great line, and it says this. If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. We got it. We think it's funny. We're laughing at it. We're, yeah. And then we think, hold up. Remember, we started with the launching pad that God loves you. So these two statements that we all kind of go, eh, I get that, seems opposite of God loving you. And how do we reconcile that differences? How do we reconcile those two sides? And it's simple. They're not two sides. Sometimes we just don't have things in the right order or perspective. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, and, and so from a personal experience, uh, a lot of you may know, uh, some of you don't, that it took us a long time to have our first child. Okay, we went through a bunch of different things and a long process. It was a really trying time for us in our marriage. It was really a hard time for us with our walk with God. It was just something that would just kind of beat down and was heavy on us. Um, and, and so what you, you don't know is that when I was here in, in my teens, I heard from God that I would have children. Okay? It's weird as a teenager. Uh, definitely didn't tell Peugeot when we were dating that that's what I heard is the... I want, yeah, it, it, you know, it's bad enough that you're going to be the one that says I love you first. Uh, don't say, well, we're having babies. Um, she would have ran, um, and she's fast. So <laughs> back when we were young, I could get her in short distances, long distance. She, she, she won. Cramp. Uh, anyway, but here's the deal. I have zero doubt that, that as a young man that that word that I received, that I would have children, was from God. I have zero doubt in my life that that was God speaking into me at a young age. That being said, five years of trying was hard. It was beyond difficult for us. Uh, I remember one time in particular that we got our hopes up only to find out that we were wrong. And I was mad. I was angry with God. I was so upset. I called Pastor Farley and I said, I need to talk. I'm angry at God right now. He said, all right, Sam, where you want to meet? We met up. We talked, and after our hellos, after that first little bit of greeting, we sat down, and Pastor didn't say anything for 20 minutes. 
Now, it's not because there wasn't anything for him to say. That's not the case at all. The situation was, I was saying both sides of the conversation. I was saying the things that he was about to say, and he, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he wasn't even talking to Sheila. It was one of these, mm-hmm, we're normally, ga- good, guys, we're normally good at, mm-hmm. But, you know, so if he was doing that to me, cool, it worked. Um, but, you know, he would, I would be talking about how angry I was, and then something like Joshua 1.9 would come up to me and says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God, why have you left me? I didn't. Psalms 9.10, and for those who know you, your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. But God, how can I trust? I feel like you've left me. I haven't. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. I don't like that one. You ever know something that you don't like? <laughs> I don't like it. His way's perfect. No, no, no. But you don't understand. We're ready. But you don't understand. We want to have kids. But you don't. Your way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust him. And then the one that bugged me more was Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Because here's the deal. When we were in the middle of all this, I was working over here at Greenbrier Valley. And I get on the elevator with all my coworkers. They know my story. There's this young man with the bracelet on, with the um, baby carrier that is not set up yet. Those things, you need a degree to get those things set up. And with the bag, you know, you know that typical, he's got like 40 pounds of stuff and doesn't know what to do moment. Uh, so overwhelmed. And I look at him trying to not be covetous. I'm not trying not to covet what he's about to take home. I'm not doing so well. And I said, Congratulations. he said, thanks. You want it? You could have heard a pin drop. (laughs) Because I looked at that man and I said, yes, yes, I do. I will take your child, sight unseen, unknown, right now, this instant. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your attitude right. Because right now is one of the most important moments in their life. You walk into that room, be happy and be filled with joy of the child that you are about to take home because I would love to be in your shoes right now. And he looked up at me and went, yes, sir. (laughs) So I hope it worked. I hope it changed his attitude because, but you know, my coworkers, after he got off, we were going to get off there too, but we didn't. My coworkers kind of gave that little hug like, dude, we thought you were going to kill him. Um... (laughs) But it's one of those things you tried, and, and you know, and, and he goes on to say, be content with such things as you have. I remember dad as a young man, when I was little, said, is this enough? Is enough? That was the question a lot of times, because, you know, we, there's never enough as a, as a child. Hey, thanks, we just did Carowinds. Um, hey, on our way home, can we stop and get ice cream? We just broke the bank at Carowinds, and now you want ice cream. Okay, um, and is that enough? Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even in the middle of all that, 
in the middle of those situations with talking to pastor and, 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 and these scriptures just coming up and, and things. And, and, you know, we can go on and on because more and more things were popping up because these were the words that were spoken into me from the time of a, a young man all, all the way up to now. There was the biggest distance divide of my life. One foot. From here to here. I knew the word of God here, but right then and there, I'm hurting here. So convincing up here that here will be okay. I remember one time I asked the, the kids in youth group, I said, is it okay to be angry with God? And one kid said, no, never. I said, did you read? I said, yes, it is okay. It's what you do with that anger. Do you strike out and say, God, I'll, I'll never want to see you again? Or do you say, God, I'm angry, help me. And that's where we were. You know, um, sitting there with pastor nodding and agreeing and, and, and afterwards, and you know, 20, 30 minutes later, we get up, we hug, and I say, thank you. And he's like, no problem. Uh, <laughs> it's a good cup of coffee. Uh, but it's one of those things that I, at that moment I knew, and, and because I remembered the next scripture coming at the end, and that's, that's what gave me some peace in that moment. Matthew 11, starting at verse 28, says this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I needed a lighter burden. We've all been there. We need a little bit lighter burden. We're carrying too much. We know the different things. We know, the, the, we know, but we can't get our heart to figure it out. I needed that rest. So after this conversation, my, uh, my faith was back in Jesus because I knew that, his, that had, he was the source, that I knew that he had taken off some of my burden. But I, I wasn't quite there yet. You ever get close, but you're not there yet? It's kind of like when we take the kids to church camp. It's not very far. It's the other side of Roanoke. That's it. Do you know we need a bathroom break to get to the other side of Roanoke? We're close, but we're not there. I said, no stopping, everyone must go. And you get that one kid with yellow eyes. <sighs> and we stop. We're close. And that's where I was, I was close. My attitude yet wasn't right. God, I, I, I would say, and this is something that I would say, I, said, I would say that God will bring everything in his good time but God sure takes his good time. All right? And, and, and it's a great line, and it's a funny point, but it's not the point. Because that line, that, you know, that, that, that cliche, will actually kind of bring up a barrier. We'll start building walls when you start saying, well, it's just not good enough. It's one step away from it's not good enough for me. God's taking too long. It's a different attitude. And so what I would do, even though, the, even though I received the word from God as a teenager that I would have children, I have, every man or woman of God that I would meet, I would ask them to pray for us to have kids. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with talking to people and asking them to pray for you. There is nothing wrong in that. Except from this very same pulpit. Man of God, Chad Daniel, looked at me in the middle of his sermon and said, Sam, I was sitting back there, stop praying 
for your children, or excuse me, stop praying for children and start praying for your children. I was broke. I was shocked. I was dismayed. I was wrecked. Then my father, who I was sitting beside, looked, grabbed me by the arm and said, Sam, God told me to tell you the exact same thing. He told me this morning, I was going to tell you later. It's what I needed. Because there was a, there, it was a paradigm shift in that moment. Because it was like I didn't truly believe the word that God had put into my heart. I didn't truly accept it because I wanted someone else to pray. I wanted, you know, if I did this, if I did that, if I asked the right person to pray, then, only then, God would bless me. But God put the word in my heart as a young man that I would have children. But up until that point, my attitude was that's not enough. Life happened. Remember, the time had gone by, but that didn't take away the truth of God's word. Now, in Genesis, Abram, Abraham, um, he received a word from God much like mine, with one major exception. He was 75. It's a big, big exception. Um, and his wife was 65. So there's a time going on at this moment. I mean, sure, you know, we're thinking that not anymore. Uh, but there's a time, there's a sense of urgency at that late point in their life. So um, about 10 years later, he took matters into his own hands. And if you haven't read this, I challenge you, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures, great, wonderful, long story. Um, but but go, go to Genesis and read it. But 10 years later, he took matters into his own hands and had Ishmael. Now here's the, I don't blame him because what he did was culturally accepted. What he started to do was doubt that the, the word that he had heard from God was really what he had heard. And he started to change it. He started to confuse it. And I get that because a few years in, I started to do the same thing. I started to say, well, maybe the word I received from God that I would have children meant that I would be the youth pastor and your children would be my children. And by the way, they are. So if your kids come into my youth group, they're mine. You have to share um, from now on. Okay. Uh, same thing over here, right? I'm still yours? Okay. Um, it's just kind of one of those things that your kids show up, you're, they're mine. I will be daddy bear, mama bear, whatever, all rolled into one. Somebody tries to hurt a hair on their head. Call me up. Uh, I'll help out. You know, you guys with daughters and you need someone else sitting on the porch when they have that fun conversation cleaning the guns. I know people. Uh, we will be there. Um, so... <laughs> And here's the deal. So I get it. I totally understand. So it worked out a little better for me. I, I get wonderful youth kids. For him, there might be some problems going on over there today because of this issue. A little bit. But I get it. I totally understand. Because what he did was he said, well, God may, I know he said this, but maybe he meant that. And this is socially acceptable in today's society. So I'm just going to do this and, and, and make it work. Sometimes we try to take what God says and turn it to what we want and make it work, right? This is, okay, it's not just me. Good. Um, but, and so long story short, short, God showed back up and said, no, uh, about 24 years after the promise, 24 years after, uh, after the promise of you will, you know, your descendants will outnumber the stars, you'll have, you know, and all these wonderful, wonderful promises. He says, you need a, God says to Abram, says, you need a paradigm shift yourself. So much so that it changed his name and his wife's name. Totally changed their world. That was, if you look at the timeline of his life, that last year from, from 99 to 100, a lot of stuff happened in that year. It's kind of neat to study. 
But after he had that paradigm shift, after he had that, the, uh, what we like to say, the come to Jesus meeting, his life changed. And within a year, we had Isaac. So it took 25 years from the promise to Isaac. It took 25 years from the promise to Isaac. So here's what I want to say to you. That word that God spoke to you when you were a kid, that word that God spoke to you in your teens, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, whatever, it is still alive today. It did not go away. It did not expire. God's word is still alive today. All right? So we fast forward a few hundred years, and the Hebrew people, they have made some decisions that have put them in Egypt. All right? Uh, and they understand and still remember some of the promises that was given, that was given to Abram, to Abraham. But they have gone from the saviors of Egypt to slaves in about 400 years. That for, that's a big change. You go from savior to slave. I know 400 years is a long time, but that's how long it happened. That's what happened. Now, the, you know, here's the deal. The, the, they're starting to doubt or have totally forgotten the promises that God gave them. Because it's generations and generations and generations later. And so the things that God had, talk them, talk, had promised them, a lot of them may not know. They may not hold it dear in their heart, but so there's those that still do remember. Have you ever doubted the promises that God gave you? So, and so it goes further. We start to doubt our promises, and we're not even slaves. I mean, we are in a different type of bondage. Depression, anxiety, drug, sex, self-doubt, and on and on and on. We put ourselves in bondage to that regularly. But we don't want to talk about that. The, 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 there are so many different types of bondage that the enemy tries to use to take and kill the promises that he's put in your life. So again, the Hebrew people, 400 years of slavery and then Moses shows up. We get Moses, yay! We're done, right? But that, I mean, 400 years, that's a long time waiting on a promise. And now we have Moses and he has set his people free, done story. That's, that's the end, right? Exodus, short book. No, it goes on. No big deal. I mean, they got to go to the promised land. It's only like 240 miles. That's it. I drive that to work and back in two days. Okay? When I was doing home health, I might drive that in a day. But that's all the far they had to go. They're walking. So it's a, it's a long walk. I don't, it's a long walk. They'll get there in a couple weeks. There were so many of them, if they stood in a straight line, they would more than reach it. So it shouldn't be that long. But no, they had to take the long route. Okay? There's some arguing between theologians and whatever people of how long that was. But it's somewhere between 700 and 1,000 miles. That's a long walk. Should not take 40 years. It did. Now, for those of you who don't know the story, begin the book of Exodus, go to it. It's wonderful reading. Um, and, but, and you'll find out why it took them 40 years. And here's the deal. 40 years later, they took the promised land. They went to the promised land. So all, they're there. So they're done. No. They had to claim it. They had to take it. They had to not just show up and say, all right, we're here. Peace. Now, if they'd taken the short route, I think that would have been the situation. But no. Because of their lack of faith, because they let life, because they let their doubts, these other things come in there and steal, kill, let the enemy steal, kill, and destroy the vision, the promises that they have. It took 40 years. A generation had to pass before they were able to get in. And here we sit, struggling with God because 10 seconds after we pray, he didn't answer us. The 
They had to claim it. So when you are discouraged, and there are times when you will be, you are going to be discouraged. If that's, if that's a realization, you somehow have made it to this point in your life and your walk with Jesus Christ that, that you will not be discouraged. If you accepted him this morning, I'm going to go let you in a little truth. You will be discouraged. But remember the verses that we read earlier. Remember this key thing, where we started with. The, ver- the, the, the truth that we started with today is that God loves you. So today, I want to encourage you again. I want, to, I want you to accept the word that God has given you. The word that he gave you in your, your youth. The word that he gave you in your teens, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, whatever it was. The word, the truth that you know that came from God the Father. I want you to accept it and claim it today. Because God's word says this, and so the, 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 because we, we let life come in our way, we let so many things, but we want to lean in what God's word says because, because life is no longer the excuse. The enemy is not the problem, all right? Because Isaiah 55, 11 says this, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So just because you've had to wait 10 years, just because you've had to wait 20, 30, 40, 50 years, God's word is still alive. God is still working in your life today. Steve, I didn't know you were going to be singing that song, but it worked. Because, even, because we're not seeing it when so many things are going on, but he's still working. God has given you a word, and don't you dare let the enemy try to steal, kill, and destroy you for it. He has tried to convince you that you heard something wrong or it wasn't quite right. He has tried to take that away, but God is telling you, you, you know, that what God told you wasn't really God. It was really your imagination. You had pizza before you went to bed, okay? So, you just, you know, I understand that whole faith thing. It's kind of weird. Um, and, and science says, science says, and I understand what science says, and if you really read the science and talk about people who study these things, science all of a sudden goes, yeah, um, that God thing, that kind of makes sense. It really does. You know, um, so there's some wonderful apologetic series that we can get to um, that talks about this. But, but here's the deal. When the enemy tries to throw life at you, when the enemy tries to steal, kill, and destroy what you have, I want to give you a little bit of ammo to combat what he has. Okay. I like having some good ammunition for what the enemy tries to do. I like it. I like it. When he's, hey, mm-hmm, throw that back. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I want to thank, thank you for your kids because I, I have developed a quicker wit because of them, um, because I have some ammo to return. Um, I, I was working, started a new, new job. I'm now at Raleigh General, and um, I don't know the nurses yet. I don't know them. They're nice, po- nice folks. I know their names. It's written on the board. Um, who they are, I have no clue. Side story, to my side story. One of them's name is Hope, and I go up to this nurse and said, are you Hope? She said, no, I'm Faith. <laughs> They're sisters. Uh, <laughs> and so I said something, and she's like, uh-huh. I'm like, hmm? Didn't know they were sisters, so I, I said, you know, um, I said, where's Joy? Uh, and she <laughs> She didn't, she didn't think it's funny. Um, who do you want to say? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, nurses are busy people. They don't have as much time to joke. Um, but so I'm there, and the, one, of these, uh, one of the nurses uh, I'm looking for, and I'm like, and I'm asking, calling for her name, and I walk right by her. And she kind of gets this uh, attitude. You're looking for me. You're just going to walk by me? Half a second. I didn't look that far down. (laughs) She she gave me that smile like she's good to go. You know, like, all right, we're going to have fun here real quick. And she said, uh, what did she say? Um, Something along the lines of, 
you know, uh, I'm here to help, whatever, it didn't work, you know, you, you had that line, and she said, I'll remember that short comment later, I said, it's not called a comeback, because you come back later and tell me what you had to say, and she's like, stop it, uh, you know, but, but your kids have helped me with that, I just want to let you know, I have to have a better wit, I was pretty good to begin with, I'm the youngest of five, so you got to have a little bit of ammunition, um, but your kids have helped me develop some, some thick ammo when it comes to dealing with folks, but... But so here's some great ammo to, when you're dealing with the enemy trying to steal, kill, and destroy what God has said to you. Matthew 16, verse 23 says this, but he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. I love it. It's my favorite. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, you, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So when that enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy, you just don't, get back there. I ain't got time for this. I don't have any time for this. Go away. Go away. Telling Satan to go away is one of my favorite things that you could ever do. Just go away. Because you know that's what you do with something that's not worth your time. When something's not worth your time, you just look at it and go away. All right? Isaiah 54, 17 says this, No weapon formed against you shall, pros shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. None. Zero. Zilch. None. Psalms 8, 6 says, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. So when that enemy is, is bugging you, and you've told him to get, go away, and he's not really wanting to, and, and, and you, you, you've ignored him, and you've, you've told him everything, I want you to do one more thing. Tell him where he's going to go. Remind him, when he tries to steal, kill, and steal your, you know, lie about your future, you remind him of his. When he tries to bring up your past, your, 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 the things that you've gotten through, the things that you're working to get through, the, the desires and the dreams that God has put in you, the truth that God spoke over, to, over you that said that these are the things that I have for you, when those things are on the line and the enemy is showing up, say, go away, because you are going to be under Jesus' feet. I am not for I am his, for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. The list can go on and on and on, and Scripture is full of great things for you to remind Satan when he tries to come up at you. But don't you dare let the enemy fool you. God has his hands on your life. God has his hands on your life. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He poured, Steve, you'll come up. He poured his grace. He poured his love. He poured his mercy into you. So that word that you received is alive today. The enemy, tell him to go away. I challenge you to go back to the word that you received in your youth. The word that you received as a young man or a young woman. That you have let life, try, let life just make you forget. Because God's word is powerful forever. The five years I have two wonderful children. God used that time that we have an experience to share, to, to help others who are going through the same thing, because we know and we understand. The 25 years it took Abram, Abraham, God's word didn't leave him. The 400 years in bondage, God's word didn't leave them. The word of your youth, 
the word that God gave you is the, is the word that God is alive in today. So take God's word into your heart. Receive it. Claim it. Walk it out. Find someone to get in confidence with and say, the word that, this is the word that God gave me and I've let life try to steal it, but no more. Because the word that God has given you is alive today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are still moving. That you are working through us, Lord. That you have a plan for us. Lord, that you didn't come with a spirit of timidity, Lord. That you came with your strength and your power into our lives, Lord. And Lord, we, we claim what you have for us. We speak against the enemy because he has no place here. He is not worthy of the time that we have given him. He needs to go away because we know where he's going. Thank you, Father, for your power, your grace. Lord, fill us up and pour us out and fill us up and pour us out. Thank you, Father, for the world that will change for you. Lord, use us. Thank you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The altar is open. We have the communion elements. So if you'd like to take part, you can. If you need prayer, come talk to these ladies. We'll be happy to pray with you. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed.